China. Welcome, we're here after three years. Of well, finally, after almost three years of working on what is essentially the last event that we should have had two years ago of the Bawa 100 yes. event. We now have, it's essential to be there, uh, an exhibition organized by Shairi, who's the curator of collections at the Jeffrey Bawa uh, Trust, and of course, all the wonderful people uh, who have helped us put this together. So essential to be there, Shari. I mean, could you explain to us what you were thinking when you picked that particular quote? So the, the, as you say, the title comes from a quote by Bauer on this idea of having to be at a site, to be there in order to design. And then curiously, when we work in the archives, what we found is that idea of there is nuanced and it's informed by other ideas. Yes, so there becomes topography, there can exactly. become society, there can become economies, and there can become so many different things, right? And that's all there in that word that he's using and the way he, what he brings to a site when he's designing. Okay, For and example. that's kind of in this maps, I mean, you can almost see that there are several there's here. Yes. Either you're there at the center of the world, of the Indian which Ocean, Colombo. which is Colombo and Sri Lanka. Or there is the there of Sri Lanka itself with its sort of low-lying plains and the hills in the middle. Or there would be the there of your route to Lunuganga. And here, three different maps showing different stories. So perhaps the there was also a story that Jeffrey was inventing to create the work that he made. I think it was. I think that the drawing is a choice of what, do you, what information do you put and what stories do you put. And if you look at and these so maps... Look at this and you see this is kind of almost from the 17th century. You yeah. have this one with a little train on it. So yeah. he might be telling someone, perhaps you should take the train. Uh, and, and this one has a whole lot of old ships and things, which is And yet none story. of these will help you find Munukat. Of course, and I remember that. I mean, <laughs> people used to be given this occasionally. And uh, all of them got lost. And I think people still get lost coming to Lunuganga. But that's part of it, That's isn't part it? of Lunuganga. I mean, the mystery of Lunuganga is really still very much a part of it. Um, which, of course, is beautifully captured in this film that we have at the entrance. Yes, uh, by Done Clara. by Clara Croft. And, of course, the story begins with this wonderful letter where I think, I don't know where you found this, but it's such a beautiful letter about Jeffrey deciding on a there and that, that there would finally be Sri Lanka. Yes. And he comes back a few months, literally. One month. One before. month before independence. And, and there he is writing his story to his friend Jean Chamberlain yeah. about how he found and started Lunuganga, the place where he sort of made his there, his yes. personal there. Absolutely. And he I mean, this letter is from a series of materials in the archives about the book Lunuganga. But it's also that process of how do you make a place? Is it about shifting earth? Is it about creating views? And I actually think that that brings us right to this object, which I know you have a story. Yeah, this I think is interesting because we are looking at a there which was, was never there and would never be there. But it was sort of doodling with a little cardboard model while we were designing Kandalama and thinking about staircases, thinking about ways to get from different level to another level. And I remember making this little model late into the evening with a cup, with a, with a arak and ice in our hands. And then Jeffrey suddenly saying, oh, let's have this made of metal. And he called one of the metal workers and said, let's do this. And in many ways, this was, we, we eventually gave it to Kandalama. And it was Jeffrey's sort of gift. Uh, it's probably the only known sculpture made by, by, by Jeffrey. Jeffrey. Yeah. It's amazing. I, I, I feel proud to be part of it but it's quite amazing that it's still there almost 30 years later and I think it, it tells the whole story of moving through of looking out of selected views it's got all of that in this one maquette exactly and and I think it's really something very special I think that so it's too. still treasured by the hotel uh, and kept on one of those wonderful places uh, in it so now we're in the second gallery of the show called Situating a Practice. And this is really a place where we're looking at that most immediate topographic investigation of site. And we have four projects in this, um, in this gallery. We each look at a different part of the island, a different kind of site. Um, the first is the Ina de Silva House, which is an urban site. Yes, of course. And here there's this lovely little aerial map that you've got which shows the location of the house in a highly dense urban situation to which 
Jeffrey sort of has reacted in a very yes. specific way, uh, where for the first time since I think the uh, colonial period, you had a courtyard house with walls pushed to the outside and the garden put in the center. So the courtyard becomes the model, but it's essentially inverting so, what was essentially the Colombo house, which was a pavilion in the middle of a garden. He now creates a house around the garden. And, and, and you see that in this lovely drawing um, made Can we talk about by this? Jeffrey. That's an interesting part because you had to keep your setbacks. And although the road never went back to the setback, he creates an, a little veranda for the road. And actually, it's for people walking on the road. It's not, it's not even for the, yeah. for the people living in it. So in that sense, he's reacting, one, to the outside by inverting the garden, and two, to the outside also by placing a veranda for people outside on the street to use. Yeah. And in, in, in many ways, he's becoming, a, a, he's creating a truly urban house that has privacy but also extends outwards. Which is remarkable, because at the time the site was considered small. Yes, I mean, Ina, Ina De Silva tell, told me once, he said, oh my goodness, darling, we couldn't afford to buy a big site. And of course, it's 80 perches or something. Um, and of course, we have this wonderful drawing here, which is perhaps, it's iconic to the extent that it's one of the first drawings that set the design style, the drawing style of the office by Lucky Senanayake. And I think this is the only drawing of the original set yeah. that we have uh, in contrasting, uh, really, really beautiful, but all we have is a blueprint, and that's what, it, that's we, what have we have here. We you have the original. You have the original tracing, drawing, right, yeah. the one drawing. Uh, and, and here you begin to see that architecture was not just about making buildings. They were really about making a lifestyle. And you see every little detail of what was imagined as Ina De Silva's lifestyle, of her batik hangings, uh, and, and her little tortoise and the collections she had all drawn into this which was actually a presentation drawing to her so it was trying to sort of capture her imagination about this is how you might live here madam and, 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 and there it is and this of course wonderful model made uh, in 2003 for the 2004 exhibition uh, that was at the Deutsche Architecture Museum um, made using sort of materials that Jeffrey Bauer might have used for his building. So the cast concrete bases, um, plaster, and of course uh, we had these roofs that were made out of, uh, of, 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 of tile. Um, and uh, it's an extraordinary mo model and it has survived for almost 25 years yeah. um, since it was exhibited uh, in uh, Frankfurt in 2004. So here we have a second project you've chosen very carefully, and it's much more a topographical project yes. in, the, in, in the true sense of the word. Uh, uh, the way, uh, and, and there are two, uh, here there are two of your ideas, I think, melding the notion of topography and the notion of material. Yes. I think, you know, Jeffrey Bava spoke about trying to create this orphan's home for village women who would then be in familiar surroundings. Exactly. So, one, she, he places them very beautifully on the ridge of this site as a series of buildings, the priest's house on one side, the cow sheds on the other, and the kitchens and the dormitories on the top with the chapel, I think, exactly. uh, on the other, other end. And he builds in around the existing structures, so he, which is, I think, a very key part of his approach to building. That it so wasn't always it's erasing. It's not the palimpsest. It's, yes. it's, 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 it's the palimpsest. The palimpsest it's, it's, the, it's the layering. Exactly. Layer after layer of things that were there and then and taking And I love on the water tank, on. which gets so much care and attention. So it, it all fits it beautifully important. together. Indeed. And of course, the other s issue is, of course, the issue of materials. Now, yeah. remember, in the 1960s, uh, we were in a, in a very interesting economic situation, not very not different unlike. to now. <laughs> And we had to manage with lots of materials. So if you look at this, you see coconut columns, reapers that are made of coconut, very, very simple uh, palette of materials that had to be used. Um, and then Jeffrey once told me that Mother Good Counsel, who was this Irish nun who was in charge of all of this, would come to his office and say, Jeffrey, we have no money. Yes. Let's pray. And she would sort of get on her knees and pray. And, 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 I think and it money would come and it, and, and it worked. It worked also because the architect was willing to yes. be open to use 
materials that he would otherwise not have used yes. uh, in a project uh, for actually achieving whatever you needed to achieve. Yeah, and I, and I would also point to these mosaics, which are remarkable, designed by Barbara Sansoni and then executed by, uh, by Lucky Senna Naika. Yes. And again, the mosaics are one of the historic ways of bringing art in at a lower cost into Indeed, and, and these are, what, f more than 60 years old? Oh, or almost 70 almost, years yes. old? Yes. Yes. <laughs> uh, and they're still there. 50. That's yes, very interesting. Pristine. Although the building is abandoned now, uh, it's, it's, it's still it's there. It's still there. And um, talking of palimpsest, it's very interesting that we have the house on the Red Cliffs or the Jawadana house yes. here. Because it's built on this spectacular site where really, as Jeffrey said, there should be nothing between you and the, the, view. the, the view. And, and, and here it is, uh, just a very simple pavilion sitting on, interestingly, the footprint of an earlier building that had uh, been used by the current owner's grandfather uh, and another family. And there was a terrible fire which destroyed the original building. And Jeffrey, in, in many ways, out of respect for what was already on the site, he builds the lightest kind of structure that yeah. you could imagine. And here we have a sort of more detailed architectural drawing of it, um, I think done by my business partner, Murad. Um, I believe so. For that particular uh, structure. And I remember the moment when the two pitched roof became a single pitch. And in many ways, it was also because uh, I remember Murad was working kind of moonlighting on a factory for a friend of his. And he knew everything about steel, steel roofs. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and Jeffrey said, Oh, Murad, I know you know about steel roofs. I, how he knew that we were moonlighting <laughs> at all, I have no idea. But, um, and, and, and then Murad brings into this idea of you yes. know, how does one make a steel roof and Jeffrey adjusts it by shifting it yeah, and, then, and then he sinks the building halfway through so yeah. that as much of the view can be taken in from yeah. the covered area and I think that's an extraordinary uh, sort of idea of how to spend a holiday. And I think that given that it's his penultimate house, it's just a remarkable exercise in restraint. It is. It is. I mean, Look, it's really the only it's house. It's just the line the on last the last house he was fully engaged with. Yeah. And there's this beautiful poem here uh, for Jeffrey, written by Michael Londace, who, uh, who talks about this idea of the non-house, where it's uh, finally, uh, it's, it's, it's a last footstep before formlessness, he yes. says. So this idea that architecture doesn't always have to be formed in, in the conventional way. Yes, I think that's an important yes. part of Bauer's yeah. work, isn't it? And pretty early on, of course, this one that we haven't really seen, uh, we, we missed out on, uh, is again about sight, it's about topography, yes. and a very specific topography of rocks and, uh, boulders. Uh, and boulders. And the story here is that um, Jeffrey Bauer and Ulrich Plesner, who was his partner at the time, arrived on the site with a plan for a manager's bungalow. And they discovered this lovely location with, with the boulders. Yes. And, and, and they decided, look, this just isn't work. It wasn't a house that you wanted to build. Um, let's just start putting sticks and strings together. And literally what we have here is a record of what was built on site. I don't think we have found a single building, like a, a building drawing for it. This is the only The drawing. only record yes. is a record of what was, was built. It. So it's quite obvious that the story must be true, yeah. that he put sticks and yes. strings together and told the Basunas to just build a wall here and build a roof here. But it's an extraordinary building. In these little archival photographs, I think you've chosen well, Shari, it shows how the original uh, uh, inhabitants lived in it this incredible sort of concrete beam that crosses between two rocks. But underneath are these very modern chairs and a grand piano, <laughs> which I'm told the wife of the original owner used to play. Yes. And so it's kind of a very rustic house, but there was also a space for this very refined kind of lifestyle. And I think it's also interesting, when you look at this photograph, you see how it's open, and that's the opposite of what the colonial estate bungalow was, which was a fortress and closed indeed, in. Indeed. And here it is totally part of the oh landscape. My God, poor, poor, poor piano. There would have been so many rats <laughs> in it, I'm sure. There are many stories of uh, vipers and various and the elephants but who peered over the But that was obviously a statement about exactly. how, you, how you must After live. After 1948. After 1948, how you must live. I think so. Uh, in, 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 in our country, right? Yeah. 
searching for a way of building, you say. I yes. mean, what I, did you mean by that? We're looking at this idea of, you know, Jeffrey has studied architecture at a late age, at age 34, comes back at age of 38 to Sri Lanka as an architect, filled with the, the innovation and the, the possibilities that were unlocked by the use of glass, the use of reinforced steel, that the industrial age had sort of unlocked across the world. Right. But then, by the 60s and certainly by the 70s, Sri Lanka's economy is closing and there isn't that availability of all these new materials. And building had, they had to find a way to keep that ethos of building with what was available. And that's really what we're looking at against the right. climate. Yes, so I think you've also quite chosen quite well in that case, because here we see the St. Thomas's College building, which I think I would say is a classic example of what he would have learned at the exactly. AA. <laughs> 1958. Uh, 1958. Uh, your, 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 your argument is whether it should be Mies van der Rohe or Le Corbusier or exactly. whatever. All of that argument of modernist architecture happens. And here's a classic set of photographs of the St. Thomas's College as it was originally built with its brise soleil and all the sort of the tropes. textbook tropes <laughs> yes. of, of what a tropical modern building was supposed to be. And the drawings actually show it, show it rather beautifully as well. Uh, the, the, the concrete frame structure with the screens that make up the, the Brissolet and all of that. But very, very soon, and he discovers... I mean, the building is next to the sea. And it's right next to the sea. It starts leaking. It doesn't... It's corroding. And, and of course, the one great thing, again, my business partner Murad talks about it, I think, in one of his conversations, uh, that he just loved St. Thomas's because there were so many rain days because <laughs> you couldn't use the classrooms in the rain. And very, very quickly, Jeffrey and his colleagues realized that. And I think they begin... For well, the first time in the school you went to, yes, Simon Block, Simon um, Bach at Ladies College. you have a, a, a kind of idea, if we bring something that is local, a little, what you call a piazza in Sinhalese, how uh, do you bring to ventilation? the single, how can you bring ventilation while yes. keeping the rain out? Yes. And I think that was, it, it, you, you begin to see this as, as, as a whole direction of examination Absolutely. right through that period. How do we bring the wind in and how do we keep the rain out? And in these series of models, I think, Shari, you've chosen to, to try and explore Explain. that. And this one shows Simon Block, uh, where you just see the original idea of the simple cantilever, but with a little piazza or a little bit of, uh, of, 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 of roof that you have actually placed to stop the rain from getting in. Yes. But what's lovely is also the way he uses those little cantilevers so that kids can sit there, keep we their keep school bags, bags there. <laughs> all of that, uh, and, and that's beautifully. So and it, they were it's open. not just form and function, it's form which is truly functional. Kids can keep their bags, they can sit there, they can stand there, look over, shout at their friends, all of that happening here. And that, of course, he refines even more in a project out there, St. Yes. Bridget's, yes. where he then lifts the roof up to take more With the monitor of the, the monitor roof where he lifts up the roof so that the, the hot air can move out of the upper level and it's still the cantilever, still this idea that children have their own world at a certain level and the whole building feels like it's, you're, you're studying under a tree. We should point out that this right? is an earlier drawing and this is part of what the archive had, right? Then the next yes. version, this bit actually pops out further so the hot air can escape. Exactly, exactly. But I think also interesting with this project is his close consideration of who's going to use it. So he describes this as a structure of sort of nesting under a tree that children would feel comfortable in. And he uses the words, it, the structure was apparent to any visually, um, visually apparent to any intelligent four-year-old. Of course, of, <laughs> and you can see that. And this beautiful drawing by Lucky again, I think. Uh, or, or was it oh, a copy I'm later? Not sure if it's uh, these are the things that, you know, what's uh, intriguing just about this archive because we, some drawings we know who drew it, some drawings we know is a copy of a copy of a copy, and I and think we have it's about all four very of exciting. <laughs> we, it's all very exciting to try and find out what's going on. And I'd like to show this one because this is a series of lovely old photographs. Um, by I him. think probably by Jeffrey using his old Leica M3, uh, and they, they they show the the building as soon as it was open with these beautiful drawings by, by Barbara. Barbara Sanzoni. Um, 
unfortunately not there anymore. I mean, it's, it's, it's sort of exposed concrete with these colorful drawings on it. But you see how the openings are all All at the level of children, for, right? For a toddler. Indeed. And then, of course, this experimentation with the building goes on. And here at the um, Steel Corporation offices, he begins to make not just a cantilever, but something that goes beyond the cantilever, which is supported by buttresses. these buttresses or these angled, col the angled arms that keep shifting it out. So if you look at the section, and again, the model shows that as well, um, the idea that you're supporting the roof and then the cantilever is shifted out onto the roof. So the angle of the rain never really reaches any of the, the spaces. So this obsession with how can I get ventilation while still And build for keeping, this climate. And of course build for the climate. You wanted the breezes to blow through. And you want the rain and out. And you want the rain out. And, and that's really what's going on. And then finally, at the Benthota Beach Hotel, I think he and Dr. Pulogasundaram really go to another level. So recently when, and I think I, re I was very excited when I was talking to you about it, when we discovered that in fact, the idea of this was never a cantilever at all. But again, the model shows that more clearly, but it was this idea that there were two columns that went all the way up, and there was a big concrete roof truss from which the balconies and the corridors were suspended. Now for 1968, hung. they were hung, they were just hung from above. And I think that was an extraordinary idea, even for the yes. 1960s. I mean, people like Luigi Nervi in Italy were thinking about these ideas of hung concrete structures. Yeah. And what's wonderful about this was, it wasn't trying to be, look, this is magic. It was just trying to allow the architect to express an idea of a place that and have these very delicate sort of balconies, but still allowing for the rain to come down and people to use it. And this, the brainchild was, I mean, Dr. Pologa Sundram, his partner who was a structural engineer, and you can see his shadow here because he is the structure behind this. So it's this. a very, very interesting photograph then. <laughs> so he's his the structure photograph. behind that, him standing, uh, uh, taking that picture. And of course, this idea of bioclimatic buildings, which is what this is really about, this examination is about, uh, is, I think, taken to uh, a, a different level uh, when we come to this particular building, which is the, uh, the Mahavali building, uh, originally started as the State Mortgage Bank in Colombo. And uh, this particular drawing shows the way Bawa and his associates worked on how the entire building, all 10 stories of it, would be naturally ventilated and not have air conditioning. Now, usually, tall buildings were supposed to have air conditioning and uh, in, in, in the tropics. But here, here's an attempt to create a bioclimatically appropriate building for the tropics. And it must have been the first of its kind. And it was definitely um, influential. It was terribly influential. I remember Ken Yang, yes. the famous Malaysian architect, uh, talking about this as perhaps the first bioclimatically designed building in the tropics. I love, uh, I love also the exploration, the effort that these drawings show. So in this plan, which was a previous plan, you can see these little scallops, which are the windows. And we're trying to figure oh, out how many windows open, are needed. Yes. And then exactly. in this one, you can see, you can feel that air the moving air through. To. So in a way, the drawing becomes an important way of expressing what you're thinking. Exactly. Not you're just to, to show other people, but you're trying to figure out what is this really, what's going on, yeah. right? And, and, and that's what's really wonderful about it. Colleagues, clients, and friends. I suppose we are all part of it. And uh, here we have a wonderful collection of oral histories collected by Shari over the last three or four years, talking to all the different people who were part of Jeffrey Bauer's life. Yeah. Uh, his friends, people who wrote about him, people who worked with him. Uh, and I think, Shari, you've done a great job collecting that. I think there are many more to come. There are, there definitely but are. There are very, very interesting conversations about Jeffrey. And, 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 uh, and, and in many ways, it also talks about the period in which he, he worked and how he worked with people. Yeah. He just turned to me and said, you know, give me 20 minutes on a site and I'll know exactly what to do. And it wasn't a boast. It was a, an absolute statement of fact. He had that uncanny ability to uh, 
visited the site for the first time, walk around it, look around, and within 20 minutes or half an hour, the concept, what the, the core of whatever he wanted to create, would have been born. He did a Q&A at the end of it, which was also like unheard of, and it was riveting. It was fantastic. All the big architects of Australia were all there. They, of course, they wanted, to, they wanted to hear him speak because he spoke so rarely. Um, and he was just brilliant, full of anecdote, everybody laughing. One question, you know, how come all of the Baba drawings are so pristine? Oh, we always do our drawings after the building has been built. <laughs> <laughs> the thing about it, Mr about Geoffrey Bauer is that he never repeated himself. You know, he never did uh, another Ina de Silva house. He never did another Bento de Beach Hotel. He was like, changing things in the garden, and he sculptures, you know, all pictures. And suddenly he said he wanted to have a hen house full of <laughs> battery chicken, but he didn't want the mess of a hen house. So all of these things were designed and made while being with him there. And what's amazing is on one hand you see that he didn't have one way or one approach with throughout. He was very fluid, he had many ways of working. But I also think it's interesting because you see how architecture is a collective enterprise. It's indeed, always indeed. And everyone so has many people a part coming of together. Each building, right? Yes. And and those buildings somehow have each person's personality Absolutely. nuanced in it. And, and you see it in the drawings, really don't quite, you? Yeah, exactly, just definitely see it yeah. in the drawings. So we're in the fourth gallery now, which is called Defining New Directions. And we're looking at three projects here which are kind of larger in scale. They're, they're, they're exploring something new and something conceptual in that idea of place. And often getting pushed back from the place itself um, the three projects, of, of the three projects, the first one is Osaka, which and is Osaka, amazing. And Osaka, I think, is quite amazing because, uh, I mean, here I think you've tried to create this idea of what the pavilion might have felt like. A whisper like. of that Just feeling. Just a whisper, really. I mean, imagine these were two 30-foot high glass boxes uh, with this extraordinary ceiling full of what we would consider Wesak lanterns, but for the Japanese who were presented sort of with it, would have been almost like this marvelous sort of undulating ceiling and hanging from it was so in many ways this was the kind of the modern Sri Lanka the, yes. the futuristic this is what we are kind of Sri Lanka but Absolutely. in it we were happy to also have these extraordinary flags by Ina de Silva batik tabletops under resin uh, of course again by Ina and also I'm told some beautiful pieces from our museums yeah, we uh, can which see, you see some of them in, in these, some photos. Of these photographs. I uh, think it's it's such an interesting vision of Sri Lanka because it's looking back very comfortably while looking while forward. Looking forward. And I think that was that was an important approach to history for Baba. There was a continuum, and it wasn't that kind of rupture. Exactly, and we we got to be modern from now Everything's on. Everything's new. Everything's new and got to be modern, which I think you found in other parts of the world. Absolutely, uh, with very interesting stories in themselves. But our story is really about being comfortable with our past while being looking very forward. modern and, and forward looking. Yes. And I, I think in many ways, you know, it, that probably has helped us weather the storms that came after I the 70s, so. uh, where we, we've, and, and it's, it's, it's the questions about the past that I think we need to resolve, but we all know we are comfortable with that past. And I think I need to comment at this point, the fact that you have put this exhibition together in all three languages. I think that's extraordinary that and you've important. made an effort to actually translate from the English or singular or whatever you conceive yes. the exhibition in to two other languages. And, and, and that I think is a part of that history I think Bawa was talking about. Here. I think he was, yes, he actually said that, that this country is multifaceted and that it has many, many layers which make us who we are today. Yeah, so here we are sort of in a way, Expo 70 Pavilion in Osaka in 1970. Sri Lanka coming out of independence 10 years on or 15 years on uh, and we are making a statement to the world about who we might be. Uh, I think there are a few beautiful uh, uh, exhibits here. The flag from Ina de Silva, 
a, a wonderful adaptation of the Ruhunu Kataragama Mahakodia, um, a, a beautiful tabletop also from a past uh, design of a, of a Giraputtua that has been made into a, a, a modern table. So in many ways, taking the past table. and fiberglass table and taking the past and, and living with it. And here we have this extraordinary maquette of a sculpture that was 30 feet high that was opposite the pavilion that was designed by Lucky Senanayaka. This was the maquette that was shown to Jeffrey by Lucky. Lucky eventually made the 30 foot one. Unfortunately, apparently it was sold and nobody knows where the original sculpture is. And in this pavilion, we have another interesting little facet. A treasure. It's an absolute treasure. Uh, it's the only recording of Jeffrey Bauer we have at a, at, a, at a talk, right? Yes. And he's talking about his work. And Professor David Robson, I think, put together uh, these lovely photographs to illustrate that uh, yes. conversation. This goes to show, too, that you can have trees very close to a building and, and, and not be affected by them. What people frequently do is to cut down old trees, and then, which cause no harm, generally, if they're looked after, and then plant new trees, which cause infinite harm as the roots spread. And here we have the University of Ruhuna, yeah. which I think in many ways, for me, represents this idea of how all that experimentation and thought we saw in the second gallery gets used up in a, in a big public project. Yeah. Uh, you begin to see all the cantilevers, the, the, the way in which you can bring wind into the rooms without um, you know, the rain and all of that, being experimented with and also placed in this extraordinary topography yeah. um, in the south. Yeah. And, 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 and we have a whole series of buildings, each one different from the other, interconnected. And once I think there was a critique of Jeffrey about this and said, look, there are so many corridors. In fact, the area of the corridors and verandas were apparently bigger than the area of, of the space that was there for instruction. And Jeffrey's response was actually, that's where most people learn. Yeah. That and I think in many ways, I'd like to think that he was being subversive. So in many ways, it is not the instruction that mattered to Jeffrey. It was really what the students learned from each other. And, and if you really think about it, it's one of the places where you have most of the sort of unrest yes. <laughs> among students. Uh, and it could be that it was the spaces that allowed them to express themselves, learn from each other, and, and, and perhaps talk about the world in a different way. And I, I, I like to think of it as a kind of, while it is a government project, it's a, it's, it's a project that is about education, it's also a project about people being their own people. I, th I don't think it's accidental because in '69, what happened with in Paris, universities yes. started closing up, and yet in '78, this campus has more public space than anything else. <laughs> exactly, and, and I think that's an extraordinary example of I how uh, Bava looked at a social position. Yes, uh, so the and place education. here becomes the there becomes education and society, and, and 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 how that that architecture can affect that. I think so. And we now come to, I think, the final project. The final built, the built project. Work. <laughs> and interestingly, the first project I worked on. Yes. And here we have a drawing, uh, I think, made by Dilshan, who was my boss at the time, working in Jeffrey's office, showing the facade of the Kandalama Hotel. Interestingly, it shows a series of tiled roofs, because by then, I think Jeffrey was still very much caught up in this idea of, of, of international modernism, you know, what you call regional modernism that yeah. they labeled him with. He yeah. hated to be labeled that way. He hated labels, But very didn't much he? the idea of, you know, well, it must be a secondary kind of modernism. Uh, but he was still stuck in that. But I remember the very, very last minute, it begins to go off. But the earliest drawing, that was an expression of what Kandalama might look like, is here, made by Sumangala Jayatilaka for the Aitken Spence annual report, right. which is entirely made of flat roofs. So in many ways, he was kind of still vacillating between the roof and the flat roof. And I remember the last flat roof was on, the last the tile roof was on the Kashapa room right on top. And then he decided, that's it, no more. And you have this building which is entirely flat roofs with plants and gardens but and it's all. amazing but someone he was very mature in this in his career at this point but he was still yeah but what's extraordinary yes. about the man was he was never sure he was, right? never, he was sure. never sure and that i think is really 
the thing about most creative people. I mean, if yeah. you are sure, then things are fine. And but if you're not testing to the end. Exactly. And that's what he was doing right to the end. One of the last big projects, it, it is an extraordinary building. You see some very early photographs that I remember taking, the black and white ones. Yeah. And then, of course, 15 years later, what the hotel has become. And, of course, you've collected all these wonderful well, he uh, collect articles. The office collected. The office collected, yes. Janet collected. Because, obviously, uh, it was hard. It was, it was a part. I mean, imagine, I come, I'm straight out of college, and I come into this project, and all you hear about in the front page news in the newspapers is about the project you're doing, and you're thinking, oh, my God, have I got into the right job? <laughs> and, and here you have this extraordinary sort of set of um, uh, 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 articles, and I love the cartoon, which is this whole idea that uh, it's, it's still going. But I think still, it was very divisive. But I also think that it was a project that brought out people's concern for the environment, which needed to happen. Which needed to happen at that point. Yes. Uh, and I think the idea that Jeffrey had already ad one. addressed most of those issues uh, was something that was really very positive that allowed the project to go ahead. And you've mentioned that he, he thought very, yeah, very deeply much, about very those things, how it sits with the Absolutely. environment. The Absolutely. project is an ecotourism, a hotel that pioneered ecotourism. Indeed. Indeed. And today sort of it's, it sort of stands vindicated yes. as one of the great sort of ecotourism destinations. Great example. I'd like to, you to talk about this one. I know this is part of a tapestry we had yes. at Kamulama. So this is a recommission by Mari Nanaraj, who designed this for, the, for Kandalama on behalf of Barefoot, uh, which they very kindly uh, remade for the exhibition. I think it's an amazing thing. She calls it the Kandalama tank, and you see the tank at sunset. You see the fins of the building, which are looking through. And in, when, in the space, when you experience it, you have the actual sunset and the tank on one side and then the tapestry on the other side. Yes, that's true. And then, of course, you have the sort of the foreground of grass just growing yes. as and the I water love recedes. And I kind yes. of the flex of texture that she's given it. Um, I think this whole exhibition is, how, is looking at these ways in which we show space and show places. And I so in many ways, Jeffrey used it right through, right? I mean, if you think did. about the Bento the Beach Hotel and that Absolutely. magnificent ceiling where art becomes part of architecture, here's another example it's not of a decoration. art becoming. It's not something that's yes. just hung on the wall. It's, it's something that's it. part of the part Absolutely. of the space. Absolutely. Right? And there's also this wonderful film by again Clara Crafts. Clara Crafts, uh, who's examining candle miners. Yes, I mean, look at this shot. You see how the jungle is just taking over the hotel and do you want to tell us the story of, of what Jeffrey said about well I mean for Jeffrey I remember him once telling me that the idea of the hotel of the of this particular hotel is really about about some kind of process and the process is one our intervention on the site how this that building then changes the yes. site the site then begins to take over and for him he said it would finally be over when the leopards, leopards are walking on the corridors and bears are living in the rooms. So in a sense, a process that takes it all back to where it began. And time always And time was in. always a part of, yes. I think, a lot of his thinking. And now we come to this last bit, which is places yes. unbuilt. Yes. Idi no nu nirmana, it says. The places that only exist in the archive, because of course with any architecture practice, not everything gets built. But there are, because we've been looking at what happens between the place we have in our mind and then the place we make, and is the drawing a medium for that? And interestingly, the singular translation, it is a nirmana all the same. It is a, a something a creation. That it's, a, it's a creation. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, the, the English sounds so boring. <laughs> <laughs> we struggled with this title. <laughs> I can imagine. And this we is should talk about these, which are more treasures. Um, these are photographs from his travels before he was actually an architect, when he had studied, read English, and was, you know, trepsing around um, Europe. Europe. mostly, yes. And I, I can, I can sort of recognize. Yes, that's the Colosseum there. And you Hadrian's see Villa, Hadrian's Villa in Ronshaw, Tivoli. Ronshaw, one of my Ronshaw, which buildings. is incredible. <laughs> He's visited Ronshaw and Bormazo, the gardens. But you also see really him looking at people, looking at things, looking at things. At things, at villagers views so you see that so he's, he's observing looking at space, he's looking at even things. though he's technically a lawyer at this point he's yes, absolutely course. invested in, in these places in these places 
And here we have, of course, this extraordinary collection of nirmanas or, yes. or, 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 or projects that uh, didn't get built. I, I find this very interesting because it starts as a dune hotel in Yala. Yes. And then you can see him recycling it for a project in Kandolim in Goa. Which is or one of the few examples. He, he wasn't a big recycler. He wasn't a big but recycler he because he got it built, idea. but he liked this so much. And he never got it built, which is really... But really it's quite wild, but and it's he just wild. works with the topography of Yala, the dunes that you see. Yes, here. exactly. And I think he's probably sh uh, was shown a similar site in, 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 in Goa. And I think this idea of recycling, I think when a creative person has an idea, and un until you really manage to Execute see it, it. <laughs> you, it, it keeps going on in your head, right? And, and, and I can quite imagine. I mean, even Kandalama, the previous project we saw, I think there's a drawing in the archive for a hotel called the Mahatkanda Hotel. Yes in near candy yes. and that has this idea of the bathroom in front uh, and and some planting and so on so i i think this idea that ideas Come back. can't die yes absolutely. <laughs> you can't let an idea die and 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 i think that's 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 very much a part of jeffrey's lexicon and what else do we have here we have we have um, this amazing drawing in Shunakam. yes so we have three projects that we know of done in the north of the island this one, this one was actually built, but we love it so much we put the it there. The drawing is gorgeous. Yes, um, it's still there at Jaffna College, I think. Yes. Uh, and you pass it when you when you when you drive around that area. But I think Chonakam this one, the drawing is extraordinary because we we I think it might be the only isometric drawing. This kind of technical, it's really an object that exists in the, arch, the architect's, architect's mind, mind yeah. put into a drawing, and you can see the different layers that, that the architect has to work with ghosted in with these dashed lines um, but what I love also I somebody said this drawing was by Anura we have to confirm this but what's amazing you is having done this yes I will <laughs> ask him tomorrow this very technical drawing and then you have this it's there's always this it goes back to what is experience of it what is it like to actually go to this reading room right and this drawing has all of that and here we have a project from India uh, called Shuhit Sarabhai uh, one of the Sarabhai dynasty in Ahmedabad. And I think uh, they were very keen that Jeffrey built this house. And these are photographs, I think, that were sent to Jeffrey to show him. To Eight kind of entice a whole him. selection. Yeah. I think just to entice him to the place because it's such a beautiful site. And, and it's a very, very interesting project. And, and, you and, have and him I saying think this is really lovely because one is this, his sketch, the, yeah. the, the, the square ruled paper sketch, uh, which talks about the process of moving parking your cars moving through into courtyards and and and, and so on and you and have him saying in his letter the site itself i find is what sets one off in the right direction so that's all he was always telling his yes. clients i have to go. i have to go to the site i have to be there and so the idea of essential <laughs> to be there <laughs> again and this quite extraordinary set of drawings for a kindergarten block for wesley college um, it's an amazing beautiful soaring roofs a little staircase that takes you up into each of the classrooms and this is from 1958 so this is absolutely when he's fresh out of england and you can full see that modernist of, yes. ideas full of ideas happening in here in and fact, this was the project for the aga khan the zanzibar hotel the, the zanzibar Mag hotel yes and again you have him saying um my mind works only after seeing this, the reality of a site. And we also have with this collection of material, his photograph album, probably made by Jean. Yeah. But where he's photographing relentlessly the details of the place. And it's not just the site, there's a lot right, of that. Right. But there's also the door details, the window details. And you s I think all that informs these sketches in his mind, right? Could you just tell us a little bit about your experience with these, how, he, how these sketches work? Well, I think it's, 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 uh, it's not just the sketches, but also those things that are in his mind. I remember the, 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 when we were designing the Lighthouse Hotel, he, he sketched for me this idea of a friend of his who had a house in Greece um, where the living room was at the bottom of a well. And the well was in the village on top. And there was a veranda that had been carved onto the edge of a cliff which looked out on the sea. So I suddenly realized, of course, what he was trying to tell me was the way the light came in through the well. So even with the photographs, yes. it wasn't to take a copy of the door and place it somewhere Absolutely. else. Absolutely. It was really about how did they deal with the problem of the door. Yes. 
and, 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 and that's, I think, in many ways what he took those photographs for. And then here we have, oh gosh, like a ship kind of thing, Port Cargo Corporation. It's wild. Um, quite massive building. Um, that is quite a wild building. It is a wild <laughs> on a, building. On a triangular site. I wonder, it was never we built, yes. We never it, built, it but we also have the plan, which is also um, quite bizarre. And I think, I think that these drawings just show us there was no style, there was no definitive thing that defined each one was a unique problem. And that that's was what solved. really what Jeffrey's uh, pr practice was about, I think. Yeah. Even the time when we were working with him, it was really about a project is a project. And once that's done and you've experimented with all those ideas you had for that, that was given up for a new project with new ideas and new thoughts. And you're right, there was no style. Yes. I mean, people say Jeffrey Bava style. I've always really found what it difficult that? to say what that is. And, and that's really, and, and that's really clearly shown in this one, right. which is the original drawings for the Colombo Hilton on the location of what is now the Cinnamon Grand. Interestingly done with Maxwell Fry and Jane Drew. Oh, course, They've been together. Course, yes, and, 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 but you can see those elements that come in, I think, the St. Thomas's College yes. with the carved panels that are on the surface of and the Dr. building. And Dr. Pulogasundram pointed out that they, the Hilton, then used this relief in their Singapore Hilton. Oh, so of ideas course. travel. Yes, they did. <laughs> ideas travel. And in different ways. Yes. And this totally unknown drawing. You're, we don't you're know who did with. it. We don't we know, don't know it, what it, it is. Comes from. But it's just magical. It is just an extraordinary drawing showing the possibilities of ideas. There's a bar at one end with potentially a beautiful batik background, stone columns, some very modern light fittings lights. that come out, some fantastic lights. And this idea that you could sit on the edge of a pool with a rock going down into it with water cascading from one of the... It's so full of ideas. Yes. And that's really what this archive is about, isn't yes, it? Yes, it is. It's this incredible repository of ideas of one man's practice. Yes. But of course with so many other people. And all those ideas, I think that's really what's important about the archive, that all those ideas that come from so many different people have found a sort of repository in, in these this drawings. collection yes. uh, that, that, that the trust holds. And so here we are, Shari, at the end of this lovely exhibition that you put together. And I think what's important for me is as we said in that last drawing, all those ideas that are in the drawings. And that's what makes this particular archive so precious. Yes. Because it's the ideas of so many people Absolutely. that are now sort of become part of a repository that hopefully the trust will be able to take into the future and you're now the custodian of. Thank you, Chana. I think that's absolutely it. It's these explorations of places. It's how looking at something like an archive might inform what we understand about our built environment, which is still, it's all of us. We all work and live and use buildings. And we hope that these drawings might actually help us unpack some of that. And understand who we are and what we can yes. do into the future. Yes. And I would just add that we do hope that everyone who sees this will come because it really is essential to be here and to see this exhibition. <laughs>